Today's talk is about um, unmanned high altitude balloons. Um, it's a new hobby. Well, not that new. But first, I'm going to introduce myself. As I'm a student at the uh, University of Waterloo in CS. I'm uh, finishing my bachelor's this term. Um, and uh, this is just my hobby. So I'm going to. Can you speak up a bit? It's kind of hard to hear you. OK, sure. And uh, so this is my hobby. And um, yeah. this is one of the pictures taken from an uh, altitude of about 30 kilometers. Uh, so you can see the curvature of the Earth. You can see the blackness of space. So we, we refer to this, this altitude as near space because uh, space is defined at an uh, altitude of about uh, 100 kilometers. So this is about one third of the way to, to space. So we call it near space. So, um, so why do it? Um, because ba balloons are, it's, it's a lot of fun when you launch a balloon to go that high and you can see the curvature of the Earth. And uh, you can learn. which was the case in my, at my project. And um, 
you can use also a cellular module or a cell phone. And uh, basically, it, cell phones don't work above one kilometer altitude. So you can only use it to, to retrieve the position when it landed. You can't really track, use the cell phone to track the, the whole flight up to 30 kilometers. That, that's what you need the radio for if you like to track it all the time, which is fun. <laughs> So, uh, and of course you have camera and sensors. You can use uh, sensors like uh, pressure sensors, temperature sensors, all kinds of sensors. And uh, of course you have your antennas for GPS antenna, radio antenna, and the cell phone antenna. So basically you can, uh, those are the basic modules that you can use, but of course you can add actuators and so on. So, so the ground system, this is what uh, I used for my flight. Uh, it consists of an antenna. So there's an antenna on top of the car. So if you see some weird guys driving with the car and the weird antenna, that's probably balloonists. <laughs> so, and of course you have cell phone to receive the final landing position of your payload once it lands. And uh, you have a GPS receiver, ideally, to get also the position of your car so you can compare where you are right now and the where the balloon is. So it just gives you a better overview of the situation. And laptop, of course, and car, because uh, the distance involved uh, can be uh, 100 kilometers. So it's not just up and down, it's also quite a way horizontally. So. so this is here in this picture, this is the radio modem that I used. It's a 900 megahertz radio modem, which doesn't require a license. It has a range of uh, 64 kilometers line of sight. So if um, your balloon lands far away from you, it, it, can be, it can be surrounded by hills or trees, and then you don't get line of sight, and then you don't have any contact. So th this is why uh, the cell cellular module is very useful, because you can cell phone coverage is very good here in the southern Ontario. So you can get the final landing position without. Otherwise, if you just use radio, you might have a position at certain at an altitude before it lands, and then you need to calculate where it actually lands. But it's also possible to do it without stellar module. So the first flight. So I, 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 I read about a few, some projects uh, on the internet, uh, and uh, this, this interested me a lot. So I decided to do it. And uh, this just, I'll just talk briefly about, uh, well, for the rest of the talk, basically, about uh, my two, two flights that I made. So I learned a lot, and the first flight didn't go so perfect, but... So the, f the components that I used was a camera with USB connection. So my idea was to use the cameras, which can take pictures, a high-quality camera, not just a webcam. But you can use a webcam, too. So um, to take the pictures, and uh, you can the flight computer scales the picture down so that you can downlink it to the ground while being in flight so that if you lose the payload, it's not, it's, it's not so bad because you at least got some data back, some pictures back. So to do that, I need a USB connection and I needed a, a small computer which has a USB host functionality. So this is why I used the GAM6, it's a single board computer called GAM6. It's a very nice, very small, it's like a stick of gum, very small computer. So um, it has USB host functionality, and it can run Linux. It's 600 megahertz ARM processor, and uh, so you can you can run your scripts to control basically all, all of the system using the gum sticks. It's overpowered actually for this project, but um, what I needed is a host USB functionality, and you can't get that with simple microcontrollers. Otherwise, if you don't need that, you can just use a Atmega or a PIC microcontroller without, if you don't need host. And um, I used the 900 megahertz uh, radio modem by Xtend. And um, so basically it can uh, transmit at 9,600 9, 9, bits per second, which is decent for just to transmit little thumbnails pictures. But uh, technically you can make the system so that you can, once you receive the thumbnails, you can select which one you would like in high resolution 
and then you send a command to the payload and ask it to send you back a high resolution picture. And basically what you have is you have remote prompt, command prompt, or the radio link, so you can actually send any command. With my first flight, actually, I needed to reboot the computer because it crashed for some reason. So I sent a command to reboot, and it came back up. So that was way cool. <laughs> so, and what, what I used the cellular module, which contains the GPS module as well. It's the GM862 GPS, and um, you can get it from Spark Farm, for example. So basically, it has the Python interpreter on the module itself. So it's a, G, a little GPS module. It has Python interpre interpreter. And basically, it has also general purpose input-output lines. So you can actually use the mod module as the center of your payload and just use this module to run all of your payload. But it doesn't have USB uh, host functionality, so you can't use the camera if you go with this mod module. And that's good because uh, it's good to have two systems in case one fails, which actually happened in my flight. So, so um, the stellar module basically receives commands using SMS messages. And it, can, it sends back the positions back uh, using also SMS messages. So um, if uh, your computer crashed, you can always get the GPS position from the, from the stellar module. And uh, so basically have a backup system, which is very good to have. But so I also had the microcontroller board, which uses an Atmel AVR microcontroller. And it was basically used because I had a um, servo to tilt the camera up or down or all the way down. So and, uh, the ARM, com com uh, the Atmel microcontroller was used to send the commands to, to control the server, as well it was used to control the relays to cut down the payload, for example. And it also was connected to a pressure sensor and temperature sensor. So the pressure sensor could be used to determine the altitude because as you go up higher, the pressure decreases and decreases. And actually, once you get to, so the, the balloon is very small at the beginning of the flight. And it, uh, it expands as it goes higher because the pressure outside decreases. And eventually, the balloon expands so much that it, the envelope cannot support this expansion anymore, and it just bursts. So. After a certain height, it will just, the balloon will, will distend because the balloon, the balloon has uh, burst. And then, uh, yeah, and then uh, it will just start distending. So, and then the parachute hopefully will work. <laughs> and uh, because you don't want to crash into the ground at high speed, at 200 miles per, uh, per hour, because then you probably it will break a lot of things. But it's good to have a payload that is that can also withstand high crashes if, if in case the parachute doesn't perform well. So it have, uh, you, you should just, what you do is you add padding to the capsule and hope that it helps. Okay, so here we have the, see the components of the flight system. What we have here is the camera. It's a Canon camera, which supports the capture of pictures using USB. Um, we have the servo which can tilt the camera sideways, down, or up, or anything in between, really. It has, uh, so this is the radio modem. It, uh, it's used to downlink pictures, as well as send the positions. And you, you get also the command prompt using that. It's connected to the Gumstick's Rordex uh, single board computer here. And you have this, this is the cellular module which contains GPS, so it's connected to two antennas. One is GPS antenna and one is cell cellular antenna. And there's also things like uh, relays and the voltage regulation. There's also a memory key to store the pictures and uh, as well as a flight log of the positions. So that when you retrieve it, you can actually get the, all the positions that it recorded, not just ones that you happen to catch using the radio. So this is what was used for First slide. Okay. Power supply? Power supply. Okay. Power supply is um, lithium batteries. Those are very good for, because they can low, uh, work at low temperature. 
and the temperature can drop down to minus 55 degrees Celsius. So not all of the components are rated for that temperature, but you just hope that they will work. And mostly solid state electronics should work at low temperatures. The problematic components are usually the uh, electro electrolytic capacitors, for example. So, but you definitely want to have a battery that works at a low temperature because batteries are very temperature sensitive. So some people also use energized lithium batteries. Those are very good for cold, cold as well. So, by the way, keep, keep, uh, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. So. so this is the box when it's packed up. And the first slide had the camera below the payload. And the, the problem was that, that it, it couldn't shoot, shoot up. It could only shoot uh, horizontally and down. So, and here are the batteries, actually. So you can, this, this, this row is the batteries. They're actually surplus military batteries, about uh, 20 years old. And uh, surprisingly, they worked very well and very reliable, too. So. And there are 15 volts, uh, because I use five. Each one is three volts. And the, con the power converter was used to convert it down to five volts, which everything else works on five volts. And those are the antennas. Uh, this is the radio antenna, 900 megahertz. And this is the cell phone antenna. You can use a smaller cell phone antenna, but if you land somewhere in the field, it's better to have a good one. So it's a high gain cell phone antenna. And here you can see the cellular and GPS module. So, so the first flight, first attempt didn't go so well. Because first of all, I used uh, surplus military balloons, which were about 20 years old. And it took a while to, to uh, inflate the balloons. So one side of the balloon got heated and ex by the sun, and it expanded asymmetrically. <laughs> so this, you can see a big heart <laughs> or something. I don't know. Um, and the next, we had two balloons, actually. And then the next balloon that we had, there wasn't enough helium for that. So the first flight failed. And we had to, to go and try it another day. So basically, mega fail. <laughs> but uh, so basically, uh, I wanted to do another flight as soon as possible after that. So I overnighted a couple of brand new balloons, uh, latex balloons. So and the second attempt went very well. Uh, but the problem was that the camera stopped working at a pretty low altitude. It didn't go, uh, didn't, the camera didn't work up to 30 kilometers as I would uh, like it to have worked. But, and, uh, but it, te it tested the down, downlink of thumbnails. So that worked quite well. We could actually see the thumbnails on the next page. I'll show you. And the radio signal was lost at six kilometers. And the problem was that uh, on the ground, we used the uh, uh, omnidirectional antenna. So because of that, it wasn't, it wasn't very directional. It, it didn't have high gain in, in one particular direction. So it's better to use a directional antenna, like a Yagi antenna, which, is, which basically looks like a ladder with bars across it. So I think if, if we used the Yagi antenna, it would have worked to the to the altitude completely. So, and the, also the another problem was the GPS chipset failed at 24 kilometers and it never came back. So how do you get the payload back if you don't know the position? Even though it responded to the SMS commands, the, the GPS mod, uh, the seller module, we couldn't get the back the position. So that was bad. But luckily it, we got the call. We also had a backup plan, which is basically just phone number on the capsule. So that's the third method to retrieve the capsule if you lose everything. <laughs> so this, I can actually. Tell you what How did you locate it without GPS? Okay. Uh, so there was also a la label on the cap on the payload. It says the, that is harmless experiment because you never know what if somebody yeah. finds it, and then they might panic. You know, like with those flashing LED signs, right? 
So, so he just called you back. With yes, your exactly. And I, actually, it was a very funny story. I'll, I'll show you. After that. This, is, this shows the, the launch of the balloon. We launched about 100 kilometers from Waterloo because uh, jet stream is wind at an uh, altitude of 10 kilometers. So it blows one direction. Well, it changes a little bit. So you need to select the location so that, such that you don't land in a lake. And we here in southern Ontario are surrounded by all the lakes, right? So this is one of the problems. Um, so we selected a location about 100 kilometers from here. It's a town called Lucknow. So with a name like that, you want to succeed, right? So th those are the thumbnails that it downloaded in flight. Uh, some of them, actually, there, there are more. So this is the quality that the thumbnails are. It's, it's pretty decent, you can see. Uh, the fields and the trees and clouds. So, so we we'll, we'll launched in luck now, and it landed straight in Kitchener. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, so it, it traveled 100 kilometers, and landed right in the town. It's, what, what are the odds? So, <laughs> exactly, and that is this is where it landed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's uh, so uh, it's one guy saw it land actually, and he, he called us, and uh, we, we went there and uh, got the payload. He was of course surprised to see it land. So <laughs> we actually interviewed him also. Um, I have a video of that, but I didn't prepared for today, so. So yeah, <laughs> what are the odds? So is, is, is it totally fluke, or is the jet stream sufficiently predictable that roughly it's, in this cone it will land? Yes, you can, there's, there are programs uh, that can predict, and they actually used one program like that, but uh, it does, usually it doesn't uh, estimate everything correctly, because you never know what the, the actual ascent rate of the balloon is and what the descent rate is, so, yeah. Do you need permission from Air Canada to launch on land balloons? Yeah, you do pass a certain volume of helium, so you should, you should read the law, definitely, and uh, get the permission from Transportation of Canada um, before you launch, so. But I'm not a lawyer, so I, can, I can't uh, tell you exactly what, what you can't, what you can't do, so. Uh, so the, what we learned from the flight is that you should insulate the camera because the camera stopped working. It may have been a temperature-related problem. So you, it, the camera was open, actually. It was not, there was no styrofoam, nothing. So it's better to insulate the camera just for uh, security. And um, also USB cable might have been detached in flight because the capsule moves a lot. So. And USB cable, you never know, it's this, this interface is very complex compared to other interfaces like serial. So. <laughs> so you definitely should solder it instead of just using connectors. And uh, select a better GPS module, one that doesn't fail above 24 kilometers. Because actually there's a requirement that uh, GPS modules should, uh, because the, the US government doesn't want to use them as, um, for missiles. So for consumer GPS, they have set some requirements above certain height. If a certain height is uh, reached and uh, the GPS module is traveling at certain uh, speed, then it's supposed to stop. It's a requirement by U US government. But uh, a lot of uh, manufacturers don't implement it correctly. So even if you break one condition, it stops working. And this was like actually a CIRF-3 GPS module, which is supposed to be very good, very sens sensitive, but it doesn't work at altitude. So. And uh, it's better to choose a day so the wind carries it away from towns. <laughs> because, yeah, even though it's good to retrieve it if everything is broken, you don't want to land on somebody. So it's better to even though risk, I'll talk about the risks later, but it's better to reduce the risks, so. Okay, second flight. Because the first flight was kind of disappointing, even though we, we get the capsule back. And if you get the capsule back, it's a good day. But, uh, it's disappointing because we didn't see the curvature of the Earth, we didn't see the brightness of space. So we went for the second flight. Actually, it was, I think, just one week after. And it actually was on October 8th. So it's about one year ago. <laughs> so 
So it was the same as first pay payload, but what I did is, instead of using USB this time, I soldered directly to the camera buttons. So you can use the, you can just control the buttons of the camera using the microcontroller. And this is has this has advantage that you can switch it the camera to video mode, so you can also take videos. But the disadvantage is that you don't cannot uh, download the thumbnails, so it's a trade off. So, but for this for this slide, I, I wanted to get the pictures back, and I didn't want to risk that the, the camera system breaks again, because USB is complex protocol. You never you never know what's going to happen. It's, it wasn't very reliable in test on the ground, so I decided to do it with the buttons. So this is how it looked. And now I attach the camera side on the side. And this has the advantage that you can shoot up as well as down and sideways. So basically, you get all, all angles. You can see the balloon. You can see the parachute. And also, you can see the ground. And you can see also see the horizon. And to my knowledge, this was the first flight that used a tiltable camera system in amateur ballooning. So. So this is the video of the launch. It's about uh, one minute long. So he here we are just close the payload and seal it using glue gun. And this is the helium tank. We're inflating the balloon now. You have to be careful and use, don't use uh, your hands because the sweat can uh, influ ad influence the envelope adversely. So. So what, what you need is you need to have a certain you need to have a certain ma mass of helium, and to do that we just use weight to 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 get the correct weight because you want to pull it with a certain certain number of kilograms, so that ascends at correct rate. You don't want it to ascend too fast because it will burst quickly, or you don't want to to ascend too slowly because it will take very long time to get get up to altitude. So. And here we are launching. And you can see the parachute as well. So it will go now. <laughs> and it, it rises pretty quickly. So you can see uh, on good days, you can see it uh, up to the maximum altitude. But this was very, very warm day. It was a lot of, con con uh, a lot of moisture in the air. So that, that produced very nice clouds, but it wasn't so much visible from the ground. So. But it was visible up to very high altitudes still. So. And this is, we go to retrieve it. We found the location of the balloon. And we use Google Earth. Yay. <laughs> so this program is actually uh, receives messages using SMS automatically, as well as uh, using the radio. And it connects to Google Earth using KML, which I refresh periodically. So this is how you get the positions on Google Earth. Yeah. I still need to work uh, out on a model for the balloon, 3D model for Google Earth. So. <laughs> and it actually landed on a farm this time, so away from people, which is good. So, but Of course, we asked for permission to, to get on the farm and to get the payload from the farmer. And there it is. It didn't, the parachute failed mostly. <laughs> so it crashed pretty badly. But we still got the position back. So that was good. <laughs> Actually, the Gumstick computer stopped working. So it's good that we had backup for the, with the Perl, uh, the Python module. And the camera is a little bit dirty, but it still works. So. And here we see the flight path in Google Earth. You can download it from the USB key that we used in the payload. So, so it went there and landed here. So I'm getting the memory card from, from the camera to get the pictures back and videos. And here we see the, the videos for the first time. That was very cool. <laughs> So that was very cool. That's what you do it for. 
So what altitude was this? This is, I'll show the videos later. Oh. It was about 30 kilometers, this one particularly. So. So those are the, the videos from the flight. This is it rising. It's still about 10 kilometers altitude. So you see the balloon is actually quite small right now. If you remember, the size of the balloon is about one half of the, of the screen. And if you look at later videos, you'll see that it's almost the whole screen. So this is 14 kilometers. It's also already above the altitude that most commercial air airliners fly. This is 22 kilometers. See, it's less, less wind now. It doesn't rotate that quickly anymore. So I, we expected the capsule to rotate because of the wind. You, you can never predict what the shape will do of the capsule. Yes? How much storage did you have on board? Uh, the me USB memory key was 4 gigabytes, and the SD card for the camera was also 4 gigabytes. It was more than enough, actually. So this, here you see the balloon is way big now. There's still a little bit of wind at that altitude, 30 kilometers almost. So, so that's, I think, the maximum, almost the maximum altitude. It's 100,000 feet. And it's way slow now, almost no wind compared to the previous videos. The pressure is very low here, so it's very peaceful. <laughs> So at that altitude, the balloon expands too much, and it bursts. And then everything comes down. And you hope that the burst is clean, so there's not a lot of bits of the, uh, the balloon still remaining. But here you see the bits of the balloon in the wind, and they're, they're tangling with the parachute. So that's why it landed so hard. The parachute was, see, the parachute is closing and opening again, and then closing and opening again. It's, it's tangling. It still reduces the speed, but not as much as the, you wanted to, so <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah. It's very hectic compared to... So it's already four kilometers. And um, you'll see that the camera will... Uh, they will form condensate on the camera because it went from cold to warm very quickly. And you can see the condensate on the camera from the air. After that, it, uh, this is the last video, actually, where it landed. So. And uh, some pictures from this flight, as well as this is uh, just less than one kilometer. And the balloon is, the size of the balloon is very small, if you see. It's uh, less than uh, half of the width of the, the picture. So you'll see that the balloon will be much bigger. Okay, just looking down, it's just some fields. We, we, we launched, there's a lot of farming fields where we launched. So you can see that. And this is one kilometer almost. And you can see the moisture, the day was very, uh, there's a lot of moisture in the air. It was very warm, but also very moist. So you can see that, this picture. So it's already eight kilometers. Looking down, you can see towns and you can see roads. So it's the poor, poor man's satellite. <laughs> and this is interesting. The camera actually had an orientation sensor. Because of course, you never know whether the orientation sensor works well on the vibration. So, but this still was very interesting because the camera sometimes goes uh, to the side and tilts away in funny ways. So this is 18 kilometers. That's already higher than airplanes fly, uh, airliners, so spy planes. And you can see the Lake Huron here. It's the coast. It's 21 kilometers. That's already 25 kilometers. Very nice cloud formations. So this is the, how the balloon looked like at 27, about 28 kilometers. So you can see it's much, much larger than it was in the beginning. And that's because of the pre pressure, um, low pressure, and the balloon expanded. So, OK, that's 20 stone kilometers. This is 
looking down. You can see clouds, a lot of clouds. It's very nice formation. So you can see the curvature of the Earth. You can see this, the space above is almost black. So this just shows you how, how thin the atmosphere is. You can actually get, get there with just very primitive tools. You don't need to be in a space agency to, to get above the atmosphere, above most of the atmosphere. So. Question? Yep. So from the peak uh, altitude, what's roughly the uh, descent time? Uh, descent time is about 20 minutes. Total okay. flight uh, is about uh, 20 or 30 minutes. Total flight is about two hours. So it all depends on. Uh, ideally, you want to select the uh, ascent rate, which um, which is as low as possible, but you don't want it to to ascend for five hours because then it will drift. it will drift too far away. So you, you always it's, it's a balance between ascent rate and uh, how far you want to get up. Because if you choose a lower ascent rate, then you can get higher up, actually. So the ascent, I guess you control the amount of helium in the descent by the size of the parachute or something? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it's actually the, the program that you use to calculate the trajectory. It actually has some values, those values you can input, or it's hard-coded, depending on which program you use. So it's not always correct, because you are uh, usually you can't estimate it, especially when the parachute oh, is holds, yeah. <laughs> when the parachute is opening and closing. You, it's basically <laughs> impossible to predict that. So this is the first image of the parachute at 27 kilometers. It looks nice, but it's tangling, as we see in the videos. So now it's getting down. Still get the views. 11 kilometers. So that's about the altitude that airlines fly. So. So it's six kilometers. And uh, this arrow shows where it landed. So it took a picture of the landing location. So you, you, I correlated with the GPS location and the Google Maps. And that's how I got that arrow. OK, and uh, you, have, you had a question? No? OK, all right. Uh, so because you have um, spinning, it's actually not, not that bad in the, because you get many angles and you can actually create panoramas. panoramas. Um, so you can do that. It's, this is made from a video because uh, my camera actually took videos horizontally just a few times. Not every, every fourth, uh, fifth image was taken horizontally. So that's not, not a good rate to take uh, panoramas. Next slide, maybe I'll use uh, take pictures more often of horizontal, because they look nice, actually. So this was made from video, just getting the frames out of the videos, and then using an auto-stitching program. It's uh, Colorado Planner Pro. Uh, so you don't have to do any work. The program just uses uh, SIFT features, I believe, to correlate images between and assemble them. So once you have that, you can also, of course, do that which is just a polar, uh, polar mapping of the uh, panorama. So you can see the, all of the horizon. Um, certainly a very nice view. So. But of course, uh, that's not really what you would see if you were at that altitude, but <laughs> it still gives a nice representation. So. so there was also some data besides pictures on the flight. So, because pictures uh, look nice and so on, but data is also Im important. So I had there, first of all. Okay, so it took uh, 269 pictures and uh, 58 videos. Each video was 30 seconds long. And uh, flight duration was two hours, like I said. Payload mass was 1.5 kilo kilograms. It can be lower if you, if you use uh, different components. I didn't try to go as low as possible. So. But if you want to get, get way high, you want to keep the mass down so you, you can get up higher. So. Um, and I can show you KML files of the flight. This 
This was actually featured on the unofficial Google Earth blog. The KML files, that is. So that's the trajectory. Uh, this is where we launched, launched. And you can, this is a very typical profile if you look uh, like this. It's very typical. First it uh, ascends quite slowly, and then here it just shoots up. <laughs> and then uh, once it bursts, it, it goes down. So, so this is very typical. Just the, the pressure, the pressure graph, that's how it actually looks. So. Okay. And of course, you can click on the pictures and see the pictures at any point of the flight. And so. What's the last one before touchdown? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think the condensate on the camera was way, oh. so you don't see much. Uh, yeah, see it's yeah. nothing. <laughs> so. so here, here you can see something. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, so because the gum stick broke on landing, it stopped uh, taking pictures after it landed. So because the crash was pretty violent, so you don't see any pictures taken while it was waiting for us to get it. So. Do you have like the final test on velocity? Yes, it was 60 kilometers per hour about. So it wasn't too bad. The parachute still worked a little bit, but not as well as you expected. So um, you know, I have the same KML file only with videos. So you can actually, there were 58 videos. It was uh, fewer than pictures. But it's still very interesting. Because then it's nice that the Google Earth allows you to embed videos. Because then you can use this if it works. You can play it. See, it's uh, rotating. At the low altitude, it was rotating pretty, pretty fast. So, and the sound is actually the servo. It was, it wasn't calibra calibrated very well, so the servo was shaking a little bit. Yeah, so it's the same thing again. So, so this time it landed here, and we're here. Kitchen is here, so it, it didn't land in kitchen this time, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> So, so this uh, shows the graph of the altitude versus time. So basically, in this case, uh, the GPS module used was the same. So it broke at uh, 24 kilometers again. But this time, I had the functionality to reset the module once it doesn't send uh, GPS updates for a certain length of time. So it, uh, once it went past this altitude, it reset itself correctly. And now and the GPS positions were back. So how, uh, so how did I get the, this part of the graph? It's basically what I did is I also had the pressure sensor. So um, there's a formula to get pressure from uh, altitude from pressure. And you can, uh, you can match those two graphs. So this is barometric altitude versus time is this graph. It's here. GPS altitude versus time is this graph. So here you can see the adjust. You can adjust this, this, this correct graph of the pressure. You can adjust it. And that way you get the altitude from the pressure sensor. So it's, it's basically an estimate. But it should be pretty close to what actually, actually happened. Ideally, you want to select a different GPS module which works at altitude. But This shows barometric pressure versus time. So this is pressure at uh, our, we are about 300 meters above sea level. 
and this one got higher, and the pressure decreased <laughs> to way, way low pressures. And then this is when it uh, came back. So you can see that it's pretty dramatic change of pressure. And it's a very nice demonstration. This is temperature versus time. So as you, we start from about uh, 20, uh, 30. Yeah, it was way hot that, that day. So it was above 30, actually, the, the temperature. And it decreases, decreases, decreases. And st something strange happens here. The temperature starts going up again. This is, this is about uh, 40, minus 45, I think. And here the temperature goes back. This is actually supposed to happen. This is the tropical pause. And this happens because the, the atmosphere is very, it's very diluted. So the, the pressure outside is very low. And when the sun heats up the capsule, it, the, the heat cannot dissipate into the atmosphere. So the sun actually heats up the capsule. That's why the pressure goes up. So this is a very well-known fa factor in the tropopause. And this graph shows it very nicely. And of course, once you uh, start descending and get into the denser atmosphere, the pressure, uh, the temperature goes up again. So, so this graph. Did start out at 30 degrees on the October day in Ontario. <laughs> yeah. This was actually a freak day, just between storm and uh, different storms. So it was, uh, so I don't know. <laughs> Hot. So, yeah. It was actually one day uh, I didn't know. So? Yeah. <laughs> Global warming, yeah. Yeah, so um, it's like, it was actually, I wasn't sure on that day if I wanted to launch or not because uh, it rained before, so I didn't know how the weather would be. But this day it was uh, started out nicely, but it was very warm. So. Yeah. Canada. So, okay. so general comments. Uh, so first, I'll talk about some risks associated with ballooning because people often ask me, well, don't you think it's, there's a lot of danger to that the balloon crashes into an airliner, for example, or if it hits somebody on the ground? And actually, there are very many launches, balloon launches every day in Canada, in the United States. There are about 150 launch sites, and each one launches twice a day for example. And weather services launch uh, balloons for decades already, so, and they had never uh, any crash with millions of launches. No, no ground, nothing recorded, so it certainly seems that, because space is big, so what are the, the chances are very low. So, and actually, some calculations were made, and you can see this link. And uh, the risk of hitting somebody on the ground is uh, way neg negligible. It's about uh, one in five million flights you'll hit somebody on the ground. But the risk that it will be near somebody is actually quite high because you still have people everywhere. But. So risk to aviation is also negligible if you launch away from air major airports. Um, if you, even if you launch near airports, which you shouldn't do, and which Transportation Canada would, would not like. And if you launch away from airports, if you launch near airports, the, the collision chance is still only one in 600,000. So it's still very low. And uh, you can see the site. But even on impact with an airplane, it's probably no different than hitting, you know, say, geese or mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the mass yeah. is about yes. probably similar of the payload to, say, goose. So. Yes, and ideally they also see it on the ra radar because, first of all, the balloon is in, in the airspace where the airline is fly, very short amount of time. It's not a UAV. It's not a flying UAV, right? right? So it just passes through the... You know, Quickly, yes, yes. Yeah. Those calculations were actually made for UAVs, which was spend most of the time in airspace where airlines fly. So it's actually lower than that for balloons. So... Um, and it descends, when it descends, it's also very quick. It's actually quicker than the ascent. So it's uh, very negligible. OK. So this was a pretty simple mission. Um, I'm sure most, most of you would be able to, do, to start doing it if you wanted. So, um, but this is a good, uh, a good uh, start. 
because once you, do, you have basic flight, you can do more complicated missions. And one idea is to launch a transatlantic mission from, uh, from Canada or United States to Europe. And uh, here you would use a zero pressure balloon. Basically, it's a balloon which uh, doesn't have a stretchable envelope. Like, uh, it has a plastic, a similar material to shopping bags. So it, you can keep altitude. You can keep an in jet stream, which, uh, which can bring you to Europe. And you can al you have, you're also to calculate, the, of course, the trajectory before you do the launch. So that it actually gets you to Europe. So um, you want to keep an in jet stream. So the way you do it, you, once you get uh, way low, because at night you know, the balloon descends to lower altitudes, and you don't want that. So you drop, drop uh, weights, so you can drop uh, liquids, so that you can keep the altitude. And the helium is leaking all the time out of the balloon, because helium has very small molecules, uh, atoms. So it will uh, leak through the envelope all the time. So you, you need some kind of ballast dropping mechanism in place to keep the altitude. And um, basically, the idea of, of the mission is uh, survive, also survive if you land in the water for one month by conserving power and uh, having a waterproof package. And salt water is way bad to electronics. So you definitely want to. So the idea is to have a satellite phone because you need long range communication. And uh, you will communicate using uh, Iridium satellites. And uh, you can send the position as well as pictures. And um, people have also done missions. One, one group, in particular, Spirit of Knoxville, from Knoxville University, they, have, um, they came 500 kilometers to, North, uh, to Ireland, Ireland, so from US. So they, they were quite successful already, but they didn't manage to do completely Europe yet. So this challenge is still open. And um, they used the uh, amateur radio, HF radio, which uh, uses the ionosphere to bounce radio waves. So it can achieve very long, long ranges. Um, and it's cheaper, cheaper radio than using a satellite phone. If you lose a satellite phone, you lose $2,000, for example, because that's how much they are. So if you keep it cheap, then you can do many launches because many of them are not going to succeed probably. It's very complicated, <laughs> complex. So another, another idea would be to launch uh, gliders. So do, you drop glider and try to land where, where you want to, for example, in the landing field that you determine. And those launches were also made by some people, so, but you can always try new ideas, so. It, okay, and uh, so if you, if you want more information, my, my page is here at the, bo at the top. Also, there's a very good RC channel on uh, Freenode, it's high altitude on Freenode. And if you have any questions whatsoever, you want, to, you want to do a launch like that. So there's a lot of people who know who have launched many times. They have a lot of experience, so you can always ask. And another website is CU Space Flight. They also they made very nice pictures in the past slides, very nice panoramas, high resolution. And there's also a wiki page um, that has a lot of useful information if you're interested in that kind of things. OK, so do you have any questions? <laughs> So what was the total cost of uh, assembling, for example, the first flight? Um, this was, um, the cost of the first flight was about $3,000. But it was over-engineered. And you can certainly do it for much cheaper. I think you can do it for $500 if you really try. So, but at least $1,000. If you have many tools, for example, you have soldering station, you have, you have the tools, then it shouldn't be that, that expensive. Any, any other questions? Okay, thank you.